Welcome back to our fall series, Putting First Things First. Tonight, our focus is going to be discipleship. Really, our focus here is on making disciples. Our mission statement here at Grace is helping people find, know, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and multiply. We don't want to just grow ourselves as those who know and follow Jesus. We want to help others do the same. So let's give our attention to Kurt Jones tonight as he actually guides us through how to do that. What is a disciple? What does the process of discipleship look like? I think the word may stir up in our imagination um, images of maybe the extra devoted Christian or the super spiritual. We know that the disciples were the men that followed Jesus and that he trained while he was here doing his ministry. We know that he was preparing them to be the leaders of the New Testament church. So we think, well, that's obviously not me. So maybe being a disciple is not for me either. We think that I've been saved by grace. I've been baptized. I go to church every Sunday. I am a faithful attender of my life group. But disciple, that's probably really not for me. Maybe the term disciple seems a bit lofty or intimidating to you. But I would suggest to you that all of us at some point in our lives have been or still are a disciple of something. Maybe we had a, a dream or a goal of something we wanted to accomplish. Maybe you wanted to be an accomplished athlete or learn how to play a musical instrument. Or there was we aspired to a, a trade or a profession that we wanted to do. Many people just want to be a good spouse and, and a good parent. In my case, I dreamed of being a military aviator starting in high school. So the path forward was clear, right? We continued to dream. We visualized our goal. We wanted it more than anything else in the world. We read books and magazine articles. We even watched YouTube videos on how to accomplish the task. And then one morning we woke up and suddenly we were experts, right? No, of course not. Accomplishing your dream involved having a plan, counting the cost, putting that plan into practice and having the discipline and perseverance to see it through to the end. It involves submitting ourselves to teachers or mentors who had already been there, who had already accomplished what we wanted to do as well. For me, it involved hours and hours of studying the books, 3.30 a.m. wake-up calls to make that early morning brief for the first launch of the day, 12-hour days collaborating with fellow students and submitting myself to the authority of my instructors. And then, of course, I had to actually fly the airplane, develop and hone the required skill set. But I had my eyes on the prize and I wanted it more than anything else. I think there are many parallels between this and what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Self-control, discipline, perseverance. These are the key ingredients to achieving the imperishable prize. This process of discipleship is hard work. We can't simply breeze by the verse of the day on our Bible app, then continue on with our daily routine as normal, and then expect that God is going to transform us in any meaningful way. Yes, becoming more like Jesus is a work that the Holy Spirit has to do in us, but we have a part to play as well. Scripture tells us that God will not be found by us unless we pursue Him with our whole heart. Think of the training I just described. I did not achieve my objective by reading some interesting flying fact of the day and then just going and doing what I wanted to do for the rest of the day. I had to devote myself to hard work, to study, to hitting the books, to knowing the procedures, to committing to memory, special emergency procedures and limitations, which were time critical in nature. Things that we did not have the luxury to look at a flight manual or a checklist, but we just had to immediately accomplish them from memory. And we would also mentally rehearse every flight. 
we would think step by step through each procedure and each radio call that had to be done. I think it's pretty easy to see some parallels between this and the spiritual disciplines of Bible study, memory, and meditation. What if we followed this type of mindset to our life as a disciple of Jesus? What if we followed hard after him with a heart that cried out, I must know you, and we followed up that desire with action through study, memorization, and meditation on his word, and through regular times of devotional prayer. I think we all know the answer to that question. We would see change in our lives. We would see growth as the Holy Spirit transformed us through the renewing of our minds. The apostles Paul and Peter both understood how critical it was for those who professed Christ as Savior to also be serious disciples of His. Paul tells the church in Colossae that just as they have received Christ Jesus the Lord, they are also expected to walk in Him, to take root, and to grow strong in their faith. It's not a passive thing. Walking in Him suggests a much more active living out of our faith. It should impact every aspect of our lives. And Peter exhorts his readers in 2 Peter to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is urging them to be spotless and blameless, to be on their guard and to detect error and deception, which was a threat to the believers in Peter's day and, of course, is still a threat to believers today. Growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus is the way that we do this. This process of discipleship is designed by God to be done with one another. Think of Paul and his co-laborers, Barnabas, Silas, and Luke, and others, or his disciples, Timothy and Titus, or Peter and his disciple, John Mark. The fact is, we are just much better off when we pursue the Lord together. We are told in the book of Proverbs that iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. The writer of Hebrews urges us to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. We are to spur one another on, encouraging one another as we strive to become more like Jesus. And Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Those who are being mentored or discipled need to see those good, honorable, and pure things being modeled by those who are training them. Discipleship involves following through on what we have learned. James urges us to be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. He tells us that if we follow God's word and don't forget what we have learned but put it into practice, we will be blessed in what we do. We need to not only study and know the word, we need to do it. Just as Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, when he says, if you love me, you will keep my word. But conversely, those who do not love me do not keep my words. Being a disciple is really about being in a lifelong apprenticeship to become more and more like Jesus. It's about pursuing sanctification and being made holy. As we live the life of a disciple, it's what makes those first things possible. Throughout this series, we have been talking about the fundamental things of the faith. First things first. Living the life of a disciple is what makes doing those first things possible. Being a worshiper, being engaged in ministry and effective at evangelism, living in community with one another and loving each other as Jesus has commanded us to do. What does this process look like? It can take many forms. Think of parents training up their children, teaching them the Word of God and modeling to them what it means to live a life devoted to Jesus. Or it may be through a Bible study or a Sunday school class or a small group. Or you may like to meet with somebody one-on-one -on -one over a cup of coffee or a meal. Or perhaps 
you're involved in a service-oriented ministry, whatever it is, it needs to be centered on the Word of God. The goal is to be transformed and to become more like Christ. And the Bible is where we learn who Jesus is and how he wants us to live. There are many resources to help us if we feel like we need some assistance or direction in getting started in this discipleship process. Organizations like Crew, you may know them as Campus Crusade for Christ, or the Navigators have excellent discipleship materials that can help you get started. Or you may simply choose to study the Word of God without any external helps. Then, ideally, as we learn how Jesus wants us to live, the Holy Spirit will help us to put it into practice by helping us to be worshipers, engaged in ministry and evangelism, living in community and loving one another as we should. I think we've made the case that all who profess to follow Jesus as Lord are called to be disciples. But what about the mentors or disciple makers? That sounds like a high calling, and it is. Who is qualified to do that? If you are a committed follower of Jesus, his disciple, you are qualified to do it. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.9 that we are part of a royal priesthood. If that's the case, we certainly have what it takes to help others along in this journey called discipleship. You may feel inadequate, unqualified. That's okay. On our own, none of us are qualified to do this. But in Christ, you can. Remember that you are a new creation in Jesus. It is no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. And Jesus has promised us that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all the truth. He will give you what you need if you only ask him.